do this. Okay, let's Here we go. go. Yay, just the two of us. We're it always back. feels a little bit different when it's the two of us. We're back. Here we go again. All right. So we were kind of thinking and got some good input. And we love when we get your emails at info at plantchainers.com, giving us some feedback. And sometimes the feedback is ideas for new shows. Sometimes the feedback is though that was an amazing guest. Sometimes it was, what was that guest thinking? Um, so we really do appreciate it. And we were, what we were influenced. We were, oh, what's the word? Can we start again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, inspired. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Here we go. We're back. It's we just us. We are back. Just us today. And we really do appreciate all of the emails that we get in. We get emails at info at And then people will, or listeners, I should say, will tell us if they liked an episode, if they didn't like an episode, or give us ideas for new episodes or kind of tangents on where we could have gone. So we were really inspired by an email we got a couple of weeks ago saying, you know, a lot of our guests... And sometimes us are even saying how easy plant-based cooking can be, plant-based preparation can be. And I think that sometimes there is what there, there's the understanding that it can be easy, but you have this learning curve first. And I think that a lot of the times that's what us or the or the guests are trying to say is that it can be easy, but just like anything else, my our daughter's learning to knit. That wasn't easy at the beginning, but now she's going, 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 right? So we have this learning curve that we need. So what we wanted to do in today's show is bring things back to the beginning of that learning curve of maybe you haven't been exposed to so many foods before. Maybe you haven't been exposed to cooking techniques before. So what do you need to know to simplify the process? What are those big question marks that kind of had us hung up and had some of our clients hung up along the way? So we've kind of broken it down today and we want to kind of give you some ideas if you are brand new or maybe you're not brand new, but you still haven't been exposed to, I don't know, tahini or collard greens. What do you need to know about them? We're going back to the basics for people that are transitioning for the most part. And if you listened to last week's episode with Chef Lauren, we talked about a few ideas of how you can make transitioning easier. And if not, you can go to the link in the show notes and go back and listen to that show. But today we are going to break that down for, we're going to put ourselves in the mindset of, oh, we're just getting started and we don't know anything. So what do we need to know to be able to get to where some of the conversations that we talk about on the show already possibly assume that we're already there. Now, when we started this, over what was it 10 years ago just about we didn't have as many resources available to us that are available now and thank you for being here and hopefully you're getting a lot of resource coming through us and here we go let's get into this right so number one what you need to do is you need to be proud of yourself for being in this situation and you need to laugh with yourself as things come up that you learn and that were hard or mistakes that you make for example at the beginning I didn't really know what kale was. I mean, you know, kale's the big deal. It's like kale's the new beef. And all those shirts started to come out within a year or two of us becoming plant-based. But at the same time, it was like, well, what is this leaf? It's not romaine. It's not, you know, it wasn't like anything that I was used to before. And because it was so coarse, I didn't know if I could eat it raw. So what you need to know is, yes, you can eat kale raw. It can be a little bit thicker Tough. and tougher. Some people like to massage the kale first. Some people put some lemon juice or a little bit of salt. And so that wait, can... when you say massage it, what does that mean? Right. You just oh. take the leaf and you just do this yeah, with your fingers? Yeah, I was literally, I, uh, yeah. Do it was you about... put water on it first? No, you... so some people will just, slice up that that kale or shred it up put it in the bowl and literally massage it like you're massaging a back and as you begin to bring the little pieces between your fingers and move your fingers around it's letting out the oils and it's making that coarseness a little bit softer or what some people might do is they might put a little bit of lemon juice and a little bit of salt in there massage it for a few minutes and then let it sit for 20 minutes or 30 minutes as you do other things in the kitchen and when you come back to it it's softened it up too and that's something that you could do with onions also you can make the onions have more of a cooked kind of flavor and texture by putting that lemon juice and salt on there too and and we're doing that why 
to make it less, less rough on our palate or to improve digestibility or like what's the it reason for the massage? It can improve digestibility because it's not as coarse for the body to break down. For people who aren't used to that texture, it can make it a little bit more like some of the other greens that you're used to. <coughs> Excuse me, I have water stuck in my throat. And there's also that opportunity to kind of get used to it and then you can go rougher and rougher as you go. But some of those, the dishes out there are just that much more enjoyable when you have massaged it. Having said that, we don't massage it. It's an extra step that I don't, that I don't really take. But at the beginning, I think I did quite a bit. Why? Because you were told you had to, or because you like, how do you know? Well, that's the thing. I didn't really know. And I had seen it been done. So I continued doing it until I just got too lazy and stopped doing it and realized that there was nothing wrong with not doing it. So if your if your recipe calls for it, it might make the recipe that much better. But at the end of the day, what you need to know is you can absolutely eat kale raw, but you could also chop it up and put it in the oven, a little bit, a little bit of salt if you want, and you can make them into kale chips as well. I think we should mention something about lettuce because when we first began, there's so many different types of lettuce and we didn't really know if there was a difference. First of all, you look at the one that's cheapest and that's what you get. And that's not necessarily the one that's the healthiest. And I think it's really important to emphasize that when we talk about eating greens, we want to be eating the darker greens, yes. right? Like if you look at an iceberg lettuce, it's going to be the cheapest but it's also gonna have the least amount of nutrition in it. And when we're gonna eat the greens and eat the lettuce, we wanna think about eating the ones that are darker in green color to get the most nutrition. And that was something that we didn't know right away. We had to learn that over time. And so I know you started off today talking about kale because kale is like a buzzword and it has been for several years, but there's so many different varieties of lettuce and you want to experiment with a lot of them because they taste differently and they provide various types of nutrition. Absolutely. And that is something that we can talk. That is a whole other podcast. What are all the little bits of right. nutrition you need to know at the beginning? But today I really want to concentrate on what do you need to know when you open up a cookbook or when somebody says, you know, go buy garbanzo beans. What is that? So let's look at some of the words okay. that are the same. So we're going to stick away from nutrition, but we're just going to concentrate on like the very, very basics. So somebody might, a, a recipe book might say rockets, or it might say arugula. What mm -hmm. you need to know is that's the same crop and they're interchangeable. And a lot of recipes, you can interchange a lot of the greens, a lot of the, the pulses or lentils and, and things like that. But sometimes there's words that just mean the same thing. So rockets and arugula, it's, it, they're both going to be that kind of bitter green tasting. And it's something mm -hmm. that if you don't like it yet, you will most probably get to learn to like over time. The same thing with scallions, green onions, and bunching onions. Although there might be some slight differences depending on where you live, more or less, they are the same thing. And again, let's not get too, too hung up in recipes. If you don't have a green onion and maybe you use chives instead, that that can work too. So we're talking about grunions. Basically. Grunions, that's what we call them at home. We call right. them grunions. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So why don't you tell everybody what an aubergine is if they see that in a fancy aubergine recipe? Aubergine is a color purple in French, which also translates into the vegetable of eggplant. Yes, indeed, that's true. Right. So that's something that can have people get a little bit hung up as well. And broccoli has a few different names too, and but it depends on its variety, doesn't it? Yeah, so there's like broccoli and then there's broccoli rabi. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of different names for these other kinds of broccolis that are then a little bit broccolini more- broccolini. There's broccolini. Rapini. Yeah, so they're a little bit more bitter and they're a little thinner and the stems are much thinner. So broccoli, rabi, rapini, and broccolini, more or less, again, depending where you live, could be a little bit different, but they are basically all the same thing. Not the same as broccoli because it has a bit that bitter bite and it's a little less, just like kale is a little bit more coarse. Mm. Broccoli is a little bit more coarse and those broccolini is a little less coarse, but you can interchange if you don't have access to it. Don't feel like you need to shy away from that. 
recipe. And then there's a whole bunch of different types of mushrooms, yes. right? There's the the white mushroom, the cremini mushroom, the the portobello mushroom, the baby bella mushroom. Like there's so many varieties. Can you just swap and use? And does it really matter? I mean, I'm not talking about the oyster mushrooms and the the fancier type of mushroom, but cremini and white or brown. So like cremini and white, they more or less have the same texture. White could be a little bit drier, but the flavor in the cremini is a little bit more pronounced. So you mm. might not like that yet. Um, so you might want to stick to the white mushroom. But what, what people don't know is that the, the portobello mushroom is actually a really, really big cremini mushroom, oh. right? Or it's a really, right. really big white mushroom. Um, and so the baby Bellas are like the mid-sized ones, Not fully grown. right? And that's why, that's why the, the portobello mushrooms are so expensive because they need to be grown longer. Mm. So there's more care that goes into it. So uh, if you're chopping it up, you know, you might want your portobello mushroom for your portobello mushroom steak, something where mm. you need to keep it nice and big. But if it's all just chopped up into a soup or something like that, just go with whatever's cheapest between the white mushrooms and the cremini mushrooms and the baby bellas and mm -hmm. all of that. Okay. And let's talk breakfast for a minute because yeah. there's a lot of amazing breakfast foods like granola Yeah. and granola. You could buy it in a store it usually has a lot of added sugars to it. So it's always nice to make it on your own. We do have a granola recipe on our website that people can go and see, and I could link to it too, but granola could also be known as muesli. It can be. So they can be interchangeable. And then sometimes muesli is thought of as a little bit more of the healthier version of it. So you might- Is that just marketing so, though? Well, it depends on what company you're buying from. So sometimes it might be the same. And again, depending on what part of the world you live in, it is absolutely the same. But in North America, you kind of find the muesli is has a little bit less sugar in it or more of raisins mm. and more of that. <laughs> it's funny, more of the granola- image of it, right? Like more nuts and seeds and stuff like that, where sometimes granola can be extremely like junk foodie. It could just be like a crinkled kind of cookie ingredients. Right. So you kind of have to know what, what you want to get to. And I think it's important at this point to also talk about oats because there's a lot of different type of oats that people could be consuming. And we post a lot of images right now on our Instagram and especially stories with uh, steel cut oats. And those are the ones that we get the most nutrition out of, but there's also rolled oats and quick oats, and there's different names for so many different instant oats and some are high, more processed than others and better for you than others. But there are so many different options when it comes to oats. Right. So when you have your, your growths, when you have your, what, what did you call them? Which, which oats are steel cut steel when you have your cut. steel cut oats they're basically oats that have been cut straight out of the plant and they are little like little prisms maybe little cubes something like that and you cook them and it's a little bit chewy but it's not flat it's not like that flat oat like you might see on the top of a muffin let's say and that's the highest quality the most nutrition the less processing that's been done then you have your rolled oats basically those rolled oats mean that they've taken those steel cut oats and they've kind of like rolled them like you're rolling a street when you put down the cement and it's flattened them and that's how they get those little flakes and then when they process it even more that's what's happening when you get those quick oats which means that because there's there's been that processing that's taken place, they're going to be faster to cook. Right. So it's and then not the instant, which is right. So it's quicker. not that anything's been added to those quick oats usually yeah. to say, okay, it's not good because you've put this in. It's just, it's taking out nutrients. It's taking out fibers yeah. and, and things along the way. So I would say if you're, if you're not into oats yet, go straight for the the steel, the steel cut, cut oats. but those steel cut, you do need to cook them first. Whereas the rolled oats, and a lot of people don't know this, you don't need to cook the rolled oats. You definitely can, but you don't need to, if you want to eat them, you can, yeah, eat you can them add raw. your little toppings, add time. some raisins, add some plant-based milk, some and you could chia. go, or you yeah. could just add hot water and it will kind of melt it down. Yeah. Let's jump into nuts and seeds. Cause we want to keep this going. Awesome. So 
there's so many different when you buy nuts in a store they're usually very processed with oils and salt added to it or they're roasted but there's also the raw version of it and it's usually a lot more expensive but you're not getting that extra oil and salt that you don't really need. So definitely read the top of the box or the container or whatever it is that you're the buying. Ingredients. The ingredients. Well, first, first look at the top. And if it says raw, you know that it's raw. You know there's nothing added. But if you're looking for salted or roasted, flip it over and look at the ingredients because there can be oils added. There could be sugars or added. And there can be actually milk ingredients added too. Mm. So you want to pay attention to the ingredients. Um, My favorite is when it just says one ingredient, like if you're getting cashews and it just says cashews. cashews. Exactly. Same with peanut butter. Right. When it just says roasted peanuts. peanuts. Yeah. Exactly. And then how to store those nuts, how to store your nuts and seeds. We like to take them out of the plastic container and put them into a mason jar and yeah. put them in the fridge. Um, what I will do is if we're buying a big, big bag of, let's say, almonds, I'll do one of those mason jars in the fridge. And then with the leftovers, I'll actually just throw it in the freezer to keep them staying a little bit fresher over time. And as I need to refill that container, I refill that container. So if you are going to buy in bulk, that's definitely what I recommend. Um, and then some of the other nuts like cashews and pistachios, they could actually get bacteria moldy over time and you might not even be able to see it. So buy what you need or store them really well. And, and glass is probably <clears throat> the best way to store them. Yes. I mean, a lot of things are coming in plastic already. So do you necessarily have to change it? I'm going to leave that with you. But if you're going to go ahead and store things, I would definitely say that glass is, is the way to go, especially if you've bought soups and all kinds of things over time and you have all these containers and you don't know what to do with those glass mason jars. And one of the things that we got introduced to early in the transition was all these super foods, these super seeds like chia seeds and hemp hearts and we don't, you don't have to have those kind of foods in your pantry. They do boost your nutritional value of your foods and I do add them to everything, but they tend to be a little more expensive. So it depends on your budget. It depends what you're trying to get and accomplish, but there's so many amazing seeds that are inexpensive, like sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds, and they add a ton of nutritional value to super pump up your, to super to, to boost the nutrition of your bowls or your cereals or things like that. And if hemp hearts and chia seeds is something that's new to you, you can get it in most of those big wholesale stores. You can normally now get them in bulk food stores. And a lot of the grocery stores are, are carrying them too. If you live more out in the country and it's not as available, really easy to order online as well. But most yeah. of the regular food stores have it. Tahini is something that we grew up knowing about. Um, being from Jewish heritage, tahini is something very Middle Eastern. Um, so we've been exposed to it for a very long time, but it's new to a lot of people. And basically what that is, is it's the sesame seeds that have been crushed down to make into a paste. And you could make desserts with it. You can make sauces, savory dishes and sauces salad and salad dressings. dressings. So that's something that you can find if there is a kosher aisle in your grocery store, which a lot of grocery stores have, you could usually find it there. In the more natural sections or natural food stores, it's very easily accessible there. You might need to ask somebody to help you find it for that first time to kind of know what it is. Um, and a lot of grocery stores carry it on their regular shelves as well now, depending where you live too. What you need to know about tahini is that it's taking the seed and it's breaking it down. So a tablespoon of tahini and a tablespoon of those actual sesame seeds, the fat content um, is gonna, and the calorie content is gonna be a lot different. So if you're on this for any kind of health purpose that's huge or really big weight loss, then you're not gonna wanna have tons of tablespoons of tahini in your week. It's gonna be a sometimes food because it is very, very dense. Yeah, I think this is a good time to talk about protein for a second. We don't usually like to break down our macronutrients, but a lot of people when they're first getting into this, they're very concerned about where they're going to get their protein from. And that's one of the biggest questions that we often hear. And we did a whole podcast with Dr. Garth Davis on protein. We've and done so many with other we've people done as well. too, But we'll put some links in our show notes for those if you want to listen to that. But I bring that up now because we're talking about nuts, which tends 
to have a higher percentage of protein in them. But the truth is all whole foods have protein in it. And unless you're becoming a professional bodybuilder, you really don't have to be overly consume, concerned about the amount of protein you're going to get because all these foods have some protein. And when it all comes together at the end of the day, we really only need about eight to 12% of our calories coming from protein. And so it's very hard to find people that are protein deficient because all of our foods contain some amounts of protein. And we've mentioned a whole bunch of great ones already. Oats have 10 grams of protein per serving and most people don't realize that. But another one is quinoa. And that's an interesting one that we had to learn because when you look at it on the package, it's spelt Q-U-I-N-O-A and some people don't know how to say that word, right? Right. And at the beginning, people really didn't know how to say it. So people Kinoi? were saying quinoa, quinoa, quinoa. So people weren't pronouncing it properly. And here's where I get hung up because I take things very literally sometimes. And I'm like, all right, we have all of these health experts out there saying, flip over the ingredients. If you can't read the ingredients or pronounce them, then you shouldn't be eating it. And I'm like, whoa, Linda, <laughs> hold on a minute. Because Nobody was able to pronounce quinoa. I'd say 30% of the population still can't pronounce quinoa and that's okay. We're all on our journey, but just because you can't pronounce it, it doesn't equal, yeah. this is bad for me. People didn't know what maca was. Is it maca? Is it matcha? Is it mucha, no, mucha, mucha? Matcha and maca are, are different, two, different two different things, things, right? So people don't know how to pronounce it. They don't necessarily, or, you know, even maca, maca and matcha have been said different yeah. ways. So just because you can't pronounce it doesn't mean that it's bad for you. But when you start to see, you know, all, all the things that remind you of sugars or, or, or powdered down starches, that's when it, that's when you need to be more on alert. But just because you can't pronounce quinoa doesn't mean that you can't eat it. Quinoa is actually a seed, but it's been put into the grain category. It's very high on the protein index there. And it's it makes a really nice replacement for rice. rice. It has a little bit more of a nuttier kind of taste to it, but it will absorb the flavor of whatever yeah. you're cooking with it. So quinoa is definitely something, if you can't pronounce it, that you should try to it's the q u i n o a which sounds like k e e n w a h if you want to put it out like that yes definitely if you, if you got that if you got that all right <laughs> so let's move on to pulses and legumes and beans and all of those things and what are they and do they mean the same thing and pulses like the big umbrella term and legumes is also like an umbrella term and then you have beans and you have lentils and you have chickpeas and you have all of those other things that fall into that category and you'll find that people in europe will refer to chickpeas as garbanzo beans yeah. a lot more often. And sometimes North Americans will flex back and forth, but chickpeas and garbanzo beans are exactly the same thing. And you need to kind of be flexible sometimes with your recipes. So if something calls for a red kidney bean, but you only have white kidney beans, they don't really have much flavor difference or texture difference. So it's okay it. to, to interchange. And if you go into any, and I like to be cautious about people getting their information in big Facebook groups because you might ask a health question and get a hundred answers from a hundred different people with no qualification. But if you go in and you say, this recipe calls for garbanzo beans, what can I use instead? You'll get a whole bunch of answers or it calls for kidney beans, what can I use instead? You'll get a bunch of answers and you'll get a lot of help there as well. Yeah. And a lot of people, when we talk about beans and legumes, they're concerned about, oh, but it makes me all bloated and gassy and I feel uncomfortable. I don't want to eat them. And we talked about this with Dr. Will Balsowitz on one of the episodes too, and I could link to that, but it's about your gut microbiome transforming and adjusting to the foods and eating them slowly over time to build up that tolerance. So you want to keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to eat these foods. They're super nutrient dense and important to be having, but is it better to have it dry or from a can? Does it really matter? And that's something that we weren't sure of a long time ago. Right. So, I mean, the truth is that, and we talked about this with Lauren last week is that if you're not sure if you should be eating canned beans and you know, and you're pretty sure that you should be making them dry yourself, 
but you don't want to make them dry. So you're never going to eat them. Just eat them from a can. I would say this is a good, good opportunity to go organic, not necessarily because of what's in the can, but because of the can itself. Um, there is more, there's less chance of any chemicals seeping in. If you're going to make the beans yourself, you're going to buy the dried beans, you're going to soak them, and then you're going to cook them. And then you could store them by freezing them in the freezer. You could also use something called kombu. And this comes up a little bit later. Kombu is a very thick seaweed. And if you boil your beans with the kombu, that's known to kind of take out some of that excess gas from it. Mm -hmm. The other thing you want to do either way, whether it's dry or canned is rinse them really well. Rinsing them really well can help with that bloating. It helps take off anything on there that shouldn't really be there, but do pay attention in your recipes. If it's saying to add, you know, a, a cup of dried lentils, or if it's adding a cup of cooked lentils, you can buy lentils already cooked in a can. We tend to use those more as like salad toppers. Whenever we make a recipe that that is a lentil based soup or a dal or something like that, a dal is an Indian kind of lentil dish, we are making it from the dry. Mm. There's so many other sea vegetables. You mentioned kombu mm -hmm. as one, but there's like things like dulse that are soup there. It's graded into a finer looks like kind fish of thing. Food. It looks like fish food, but it's got a good salt content and different nutrient values in there that you could sprinkle on things. But dulse is another option, but there are so many others. There's a lot of different. There's so many options, options yeah. in this lifestyle that it's not, you're not just eating lettuce. And that's, that's the crazy thing. Another, another category was potatoes and tubers to be specific tubers, that we had to learn about. It's very Australian. Yeah. Yeah. But sweet potatoes and yams and white potatoes and potatoes as a category are just so good. I mean, from our perspective, they're just so good. There's, I know there's people that will disagree, but it's got so much nutrient value and it's so versatile as a vegetable to be able to use in so many different ways. Now, keep in mind any of the things we mentioned today, there might be a couple of you out there where these foods don't sit well with you yet, or you might not be able to eat them long term, but we're talking generalized today. So one thing that actually had us confused until very recently as well, so don't feel bad about you being confused about all of these things, is the difference between sweet potato and yam. Mm. Um, now, if you look up what is, a, what is a sweet potato versus a yam online? It is gonna be clear as day, clear as day. So for example, we went to, we, we go to a farm every week and we help to feed the animals and put them to bed. It's really cute. And there's a list of what we can't feed the animals. We're allowed to feed the pigs yam, but we're not allowed to feed them sweet potato. So whenever sweet potato comes up, we put it in, in this excess food bowl so that we know that we're not giving it to the, to the animals. And we were just throwing all the sweet potatoes in there because we're like, well, we don't know which, what's the difference between the sweet potato and the yam. To so we may as well, same. to you, it's the same. However, what the government has done is the government has actually said that every yam needs to be labeled as a sweet potato. Well, to me, it's, just, it's always been the same thing. Right. So from that, people have been like, oh, yam and sweet potato, they're the same thing. And we can't really figure out which one is which they look. And I thought for the longest time that they looked identical, but there was like maybe something in the texture or the color that made it different. Do you know what a yuca is? For yep. those of you who don't know what a yuca is, you can look up a yuca or you can look up a yam and a yuca is like white on the inside. And then it's got a very thick outside to it. It almost looks like a coconut or it looks very fibrous and very bark like on the outside, yeah. but, but picture the shape of a potato. Yeah. That is a yam. A sweet potato is that orange potato. Well, a wait, yuka wait. A is, sweet potato, there's like over 40 different right, varieties there's, there's, and fine, different fine, colors. Fine. And yeah, so you're talking, so, about, the I'm talking about the standard orange. sweet potato that you're going to find in just about any grocery store, right? right? And looks nothing like a yam. A yam looks like a sweet potato shape but it has a very, very barky outside and you would never want to eat that outside. That's what a yam is. So there is a huge, huge difference. Yeah. Yam is a lot more like a yuca, um, which is kind of like a tuber. Okay. It's um, like more like a Cuban kind of tuber. Anyway, to that's me, what I wanted you to thing. know, but there are tons of varieties of potatoes, there tons are. of variety of sweet potatoes. Some of them can definitely be used interchangeably. Some of them, not so much. 
Okay, so people that are transitioning to this lifestyle, and when we did this at first, we were always checking ingredients because we're trying to avoid certain things. And I know people talk about this as being so restrictive and so difficult, and it can be in some ways, and it is in some ways. But one of the things that we're trying to avoid is consuming dairy products. And a lot of processed foods, a lot of foods that are, have labels, will have milk ingredients or dairy listed in their ingredients. And sometimes we don't know what certain things are and the term whey came up. Yes, so whey is something that is very big in a lot of the powders or mixes to make smoothies or shakes. Mm. So when you're buying those big tubs and you're scooping it out, whey is an ingredient that is basically broken down the protein from dairy. So if you see whey in anything, you need to say H E Y W H E Y. You need to say no way to way, <laughs> no W A Y to W H E Y. You don't want to have whey. That is, that is dairy. It, it has dairy. One thing that you can do is always flip over the container and you could check for how much cholesterol might be in a product. If you see any product that has Anything more than zero cholesterol, it means that it does contain animal products. However, just because it says zero next to cholesterol does not mean that it doesn't contain animal products because if the, if the amount of animal products in there is so small that it's not actually coming up for that measurement, yeah. then it might still be in there. So that's number one. Check if it has cholesterol. If it does, you say no way. And that's something that you cannot have. Number two is look down at the ingredients. Does it say milk protein? Does it say whey? Does it say butter? Does it say butter fat? Those are some of the indications that there are dairy products in there too. And a lot of the North American made products on the label at the end of the ingredients, it will say contains, and it will list the allergens that it contains. So it might say contains shellfish it might say contains fish it might say contains dairy right it doesn't always say contain eggs milk it's, soy eggs right lots so, of yeah so that's another way that you can tell as well so i would say number one actually check for those allergens yeah number two check the cholesterol number three check the actual ingredients and then you'll know exactly and that's a great, great way to know if it contains any animal product at all because we're trying to avoid consuming animal products yes and there are so many different dairy alternatives out there from cheeses to butters to sour creams to whipped creams to regular to milks doesn't mean they're all healthy for you but they exist mm. and you can usually find a dairy alternative to just about anything. Right. And I mentioned eggs in that list. And that's one of the other things that so many people struggle with. They're baking something and they don't know how to replace eggs. And yes, you can go to the store now these days and buy an egg replacement and use that. Also, depending where you live, not right. everywhere. Yeah. Right. And so what are some other ways that you could replace eggs in recipes? So for me, it kind of depends which kind of recipe I'm replacing it with. If you Google ways to replace egg, then you're going to get a whole bunch of different options. But in baking, the number one way that I do that, or even sometimes even in the savory dishes as well, is I will take one tablespoon of ground flax. Flax is a seed. You could buy it ground or you could ground it yourself, depending on if you're just using it for egg or for nutrient value would depend. However, you would take one tablespoon of ground flax and three tablespoons of water. And then you kind of whisk that together with a fork and let it sit for about five minutes. And it's going to thicken up. It's going to absorb together. And then that can replace the egg in the recipe. If you're going to be doing something more like meringues or something that yeah. is, or quiche that's so egg-based, then you might go with something more like aquafaba. And there are different ways that you could replace eggs. And we did recently put up a post on our Instagram feed that shows you some different ways to do eggs. So you can go check that out too. Uh, one of the other things, and probably the last thing that I think we should talk about is supplementation. And one of the things that two of the supplements that we learned that is absolutely important for all of us is vitamin D and vitamin B12. 
Yeah, we don't, we, we didn't just learn that. That's something that we teach right. and we make sure that all of our clients, whether they are plant-based or not, are getting some form of B12 and some form of vitamin D. And what I also recommend to you, because you'll get some differences on how much should you take and how much do you need and where do you live in the world? Next time you get a blood test, I would say, ask your doctor to include both of those things. Get a benchmark for yourself. Know if you're high or low or average on any of those things, because that will determine how much you need to take moving forward. Um, and that's kind of one of the warnings, what, what I meant before, when you put something in a Facebook group and you get a hundred different people giving you answers, but they don't really have enough background before. Um, you don't want to have too much vitamin D. That's definitely something that you don't want to have too little. You don't want to have too much. You want to be in the middle. So you want to know where you're at now so that you kind of have an idea of how much to supplement going I don't know forward. if you can have too much vitamin D though. There's a lot of information well, it, out there saying that you can go high. Well, you can go high. It's how much your body's absorbing too, right. which makes so a difference. You don't yeah. Know. Yeah. There's a, listen, there's a lot of information in this episode that we just went through. Uh, if you're a beginner, that could be very overwhelming. So you might want to listen to this episode more than one time, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that we also forgot to mention or didn't talk about. And if there's something that you question or you want to know more about, please send us an email at info at planttrainers.com and let us know so that we can answer your questions because we are here to help you and want to help as many people as we can. And if there's something that you were completely confused about, not from a nutritional standpoint, but from an actual vocabulary standpoint, from the beginning and you're like, oh, why didn't they say that one? That's the biggest one. Let us know. Let us know. Maybe we could get a little post going with a couple of your different answers. So if there's something vocabulary wise that you were like, I've never heard of that before, or I always mix these two things up, let us know because if it happened to you, chances are it is happening or will happen to somebody else. So we let's, let's help them together. All right, everybody have a great week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.